welcome to the Hell Has an Exit podcast. I'm your host, Brian Alzate. This show is not affiliated with any specific 12-step program. If you or a loved one is struggling with an addiction, please find a local 12-step meeting. If you believe you may need detox or drug treatment of any kind, please call 888-699-9395 to speak to a specialist. The show is sponsored by United Recovery Project, a state-of-the-art drug and alcohol rehab facility. You can visit our website at unitedrecoveryproject.com. Hey, welcome to Hell Has an Exit. I'm your host, Brian Alzate. This show, we interview individuals who struggle with addiction, anybody who's ever been through adversity in their life. Uh, We've had Holocaust survivors on here. We've had people who have been wrongfully convicted and spent 32 years in prison. But my real niche and uh, where I come from is really uh, drug addiction and recovery. Some people have messaged me before asking about the 12 steps. And like, I really just try to guide people to go to a meeting. You know, I, I don't really try to claim that this is any substitute for recovery. I always try to point people to meetings. You know, even if you need like drug and alcohol rehab, um, you can always call like the 1 800 number. But really, like, it isn't until you start going to meetings that you're not really going to find real recovery. Drug and alcohol rehab is not recovery, therapy is not recovery. And that's just for me. Like, this is just my personal opinion. I don't claim to have all the answers. I definitely don't claim to be right all the time. This is just my perspective. Uh, Like my friend Danny Prada says, like every point of view is a view from a point, you know? So this is just my personal beliefs. And um, I have friends that stop going to meetings. You know, I have friends that haven't worked the 12 steps. I have friends that just smoke weed that used to, you know, be drug abusers. And, um... I'm a 12-step guy. I go to 12-step meetings. I got a sponsor. I work the steps. I've worked the steps plenty of times. I've worked the traditions. I believe if you're not working the traditions, you're only working half a program. Um, This is really what I believe in. And I don't think that if someone believes something differently that it makes me insecure about my own belief. I hope what I believe in doesn't make someone else insecure about their own beliefs. But I do believe confidently and I do believe from personal experience. And I also have my belief coming from the thousands of people I've seen come in and out of the rooms of the 12 step program that I attend. I believe in following a program to the best of your ability, trying not to get ahead of myself. Uh, I just want to take a moment to do the serenity prayer. You know, I truly believe that the serenity prayer is the fundamental beginning of learning to quiet your mind you know it was the first thing i learned how to do it's the first thing i did that i didn't even know i was doing you know if you go to any meeting any 12-step meeting whether you're in this country or another country whether you're in the hood whether you're in beverly hills chances are they're going to open the meeting with a serenity prayer and um what's so significant about the serenity prayer and the praying is that This is something we start with and um, every meeting. So I probably had said the serenity prayer a hundred times before I even considered myself being in recovery. Um, I believe in the power of prayer. I don't think it's like some hocus pocus weird stuff. I do believe that words are powerful. And even if you don't believe it or know what it means, I do think that there is a power in prayer. Uh, A lot of times people say that they were prayed into the rooms. You know, I remember when I started to realize that when we pray for that sick and suffering addict, that that was once me, that these people were praying for me before they even knew me. Um, I also like to explain to people that the program are not the people. The people's not the program. Like people are going to let you down. You don't need 5,000 friends in recovery to uh, stay clean. You know, the literature talks about you need one person to help you stay clean. One guy, that's it. You don't need five friends. You don't even need like an army of people to really believe in you. For this thing to work, you really just need one person, just one person that believes in you and wants to help you in your recovery. And if you got that and a higher power and the willingness to work the steps, you can stay clean for the rest of your life, period. Um, So with that, I'm going to ask that we take a moment to do the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. You know, even like taking that breath, you know, um, I think I had like five or six years clean when I started to hear from other people that 
uh, your breath controls your thoughts. You know, the way you breathe is has to do and is a uh, congruent with the way that you think. And um, sometimes the most important thing an addict can learn is just how to take a deep breath. You know, I know for me, I was impulsive my whole life. If I have a thought and I have an urge, that's really all I need. You know, I didn't need a full tank of gas to go. I just needed a couple drops and I was, you know, had my motor going. Like I just need a little bit. And um, that impulsion, it, it took over me. You know, I believe that this is a three-part disease. Uh, the disease of addiction is uh, physical, mental, and spiritual. And um, I would say most doctors agree with this. You know, when I first got clean, I used to go on the internet and try to disprove the 12 steps or whatever. And like what I found online was that a lot of people do believe in the 12 steps, even like scientists, you know. And um, when you go to court, they suggest you work the program. Whether you're in Beverly Hills or like, you know, the Hamptons, like it doesn't matter. Like whether you're in the hood or in a nice area, whether you're in a different country, you know, like 12 step uh, programs are really saving lives and helping addicts all over the world. And I'm not, you know, and it's not a cult, you know. Um, and like, to be honest, like I was so desperate when I got clean, like if it was a cult, like I was cool. Like I was willing to do whatever it took to stop using. Like I didn't think using was fun. I was totally done. I was ready. Um, I was willing. I was open minded. Like when I got here, um, like I was just about ready to do anything um, if it meant to stop using. I didn't always feel that way. You know, I didn't always, every single day was totally grateful to be here. You know, my first year clean, I shared like I was crying a lot. You know, my first year clean, I was raising my hand, uh, talking about wanting to commit suicide, um, struggling with my identity. You know, I think um, that's something people don't really realize. Like I got clean, didn't have an identity, had no idea who I was, who am I without the drugs? The drugs were everything. They were like, what type of music I listened to, who I hung out with. It was every, it was there when the girl left. It was there when the girl was there. It was there like when my parents were yelling, like it was always there. Like the drugs had become like this security blanket in like this cold winter, like no matter what, it was just always there. And um, like the drugs never let me down. You know, every time I went to go cop, it did what it needed to do until it didn't. And like the literature says, like the drugs cease to start uh, work. You know, they stop working. Drugs stop working for us. And I reached that point where like I was doing drugs and I no longer was feeling the high. And it's not that I wasn't high. It's just that the pain was so unbearable that the drugs were no longer able to take it away. And then that what literature talks about, like, what is there left to do? And, um, you know, the 12 step program was invented for the worst of the worst, you know, like the 12 step program was made to be able to work on the worst drug addicts in the world, the worst alcoholics in the world. You know, this is something that was the last house on the block, that this is where people went when religion didn't work, when medicine didn't work, when spirituality didn't work, when praying over you didn't work, when going to detoxes multiple times didn't work, when jail, 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 jail didn't work. You know, this was what people went to when there was nothing else to go to, the last house on the block. And um, it works. You know, that's the most important thing about the whole program. The most important part about the whole 12 steps is that it works. We say that many times. A lot of people say like, you know, they focus on all these different things and it doesn't really matter like black, white, fat, short, skinny, your religious belief, like it doesn't matter. The most important thing that matters is that this works, that it's proven, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, maybe millions of people have gotten clean through the 12 steps. And like the literature talks about that there was a time where there wasn't the 12 steps. There was a time where people were talking about, I got clean and the 12 steps weren't even around, you know, that I was ready to get clean 15 years before the 12 steps were invented. And um, we're talking about like the 1950s, you know, so I still believe like the 12 steps is like a new thing. It's still like a new invention. It's not really that old when you consider um, some other type of modalities or like Christianity or some of these other things that have been around hundreds and hundreds of years. You know, 12 steps is fairly new. And you could trace it back to like the Oxford group. And, um, you know, if you want to get into like the real history of, uh, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous and how the 12 steps started, like it's really interesting. You know, it's really interesting that it's free, you know, because um, 
you know, when I worked the traditions and we did like the seven tradition, like I started to ask myself like, wow, like what if it wasn't free? You know, you can go anywhere in the world and you can find a 12 step meeting for free. You can sit in with people that have struggled the same struggle you've struggled with and walk in and feel at home anywhere you go. It could be in a different language. It could be different types of people, different age groups. But the message is always the same. And the message is that any addict, any addict can get clean, lose desire to use, and find a new way of life. And that third part is the hit. You know, so our message is in three parts that you can stop using, lose the desire to use, and find a new way of life. Those three parts mix in with the three parts of the disease. The disease is physical, mental, and spiritual. Just like it's in three parts, that's steps one, two, and three. Steps one, two, and three identify the issues with the physical in step one, the mental in step two, and the spiritual in step three. So our message is in three parts, one, two, and three. Um, even though there are 12 steps, I believe that the the order of one, two, and three is, you know, throughout our program, right? Like after you've worked the steps a couple of times, you start to realize that every situation causes you to go back to one, two, and three. Surrender, open your mind, identify, turn it over, one, two, and three. And um, for some people who have never worked the 12 steps, like this might sound like crazy or like weird to you. I'm going to try to break it down the best I can. Um, you know, some people told me, you know, I had listened to your podcast all the time, but I don't know what the 12 steps are. And um, I'm going to talk about the 12 steps. If you listen to this podcast, that does not mean you've worked the 12 steps. If you have an understanding of the 12 steps, that does not mean you've worked the 12 steps. If you can recite the literature, it does not mean you've worked the 12 steps. The only way to work the 12 steps is to work them. And the only incorrect way to work them is by yourself, you know? So, and that's something that's been said, I'm sure, for years and years and years before I even got clean. The only wrong way to work the steps is by yourself. With that being said, I do believe in a lot of reading and a lot of writing. You know, the 12 step program that I come from, we do a lot of reading and we do a lot of writing. And um, basically, what the 12 steps are is that somebody will give you. An assignment. You know, one of my first assignments ever was to look myself in the mirror and give myself seven compliments. Um, it changed my life. You know, I always grew up thinking I was ugly, hated myself. And I didn't say dislike myself. I'm talking about hated myself, hated who I was, hated the way I looked. When people would pull out a camera, I would turn away. I knew where all the mirrors were in school because I didn't want to look at myself. I hated seeing pictures of myself, even before the drugs. You know, and growing up, I was told that, you know, like my brother was good looking and that I was funny. You know, um, some of the other kids in the neighborhood clowned on me and called me ugly or I thought I had a big nose or I just, you know, I had insecurities growing up. And everyone does. Right. Like this doesn't mean I'm an addict because I have insecurities. But when you're an addict, you obsess about those insecurities. And I go to crazy lengths to save myself from those insecurities where like someone might think that they're insecure about something and think about it a little bit, but they're not going to go to extreme lengths to get rid of that insecurity where I was, where I was willing to, to bully other kids. You know, a lot of people listen to my story and they're like, oh, I felt so bad for you. L like, um, like maybe I didn't display how I really was, but like as a kid, like no one was really feeling bad for me. Like I was rude. I was nasty. Even though like kids mess with me, like I mess with a lot of kids, you know, as a grown adult, there are like some women that have came up to me and were like, yo, you fucked me up in middle school. I had this girl that was telling me like, yo, you like really, really fucking made me feel bad about, about myself in middle school, you know? And um, like, like there's no amount of amends I can do to like restore that, you know, like I still have shame about some of those stories. Um, being from South Florida, people still come up to me and, and bring up the past and um, working the 12 steps, I can try to change and be a better person. And sometimes I still fall short, you know, a lot of times when I speak, I like to invite everybody. Like I always like to say, like, it doesn't matter if you shoot heroin, doesn't matter if you drink alcohol, doesn't matter if you pop pills, doesn't matter if you snort pills, doesn't matter like what you use or how you use if this was Gamblers Anonymous, nobody would be like, oh, well, you know, you play scratch offs or you play blackjack, like whatever game you play to get here, you got here, right? Like, let's just include everybody. It's silly how 
as drug addicts, we judge each other by how much or what we used, when the reality is that the ends are always the same, jails, institutions, and death. And that's just me. That's just like what I believe, right? And I came in judging. I came in judging, oh, like this person's not a real addict or this person's not a real addict or whatever. And, um, you know, the guy that shoots heroin is judging the person that snorts it because they're wasting it. You know, that's what people who shoot up tell people who snort it. You're wasting it. And the guy that snorts it is looking at the guy that shoots up and it's like, well, at least I'm not a fucking piece of shit, you know, because that's our perception that, that if you're an IV drug addict, you're the lowest of the low, you know, people that drink alcohol struggle with relating to some other people because they're like, oh, I just drink alcohol. It's just beer. You know, alcohol is the most dangerous drug on the planet. You know, it really destroys lives slowly. If you put a frog in hot water, it'll jump out. But if you put a frog in cold water and slowly boil it, it'll sit in there until it dies. And that's what we do as addicts. You know, it's a slow thing. You know, most of us don't have a, you know, we use one drug and became an addict. It's kind of a process. And just like there's a process to become who we were when we we're out there using, there's a process to undo all that. That process is called the 12 steps. If you go to meetings, I don't believe you're in recovery. If you've been clean a long time, I don't believe you're in recovery. I truly believe to say you're in recovery, you have to work the 12 steps. Um, I really believe that the 12 steps is night and day difference from someone who's clean. I believe that this is the game changer in your life. And it doesn't mean that if you work the steps, you're going to become rich and famous. It doesn't mean that your problems are going to go away. But it is the beginning of cracking the shell open. It's the beginning of peeling the layers on the onion of to find out who you really are. You know, the 12 steps is the biggest gift you can give to yourself. You know, when I got clean, I wanted to tell my parents I was sorry. I wanted to get the job back. I wanted to get, you know, my health looking good. But really, I needed to focus that energy on working the steps. The working the steps was what's going to change me from the inside out and not worry about the outside. And I was somebody that uh, my whole, whole worth was based on the outside. And um, sometimes I can still slip into that, you know, even as like an adult with multiple years clean, 13 years clean, like I can still fall into focusing on the outside. So on this episode, I'm going to dive into what the 12 steps are. Step one, we admitted we were powerless over our addiction and that our lives had become unmanageable. I'm going to say that again. Step one, we admitted that we were powerless over our addiction and our lives had become unmanageable. The most important word in the first step is were. We were powerless. You know, there's nothing you can do about a situation you don't believe you have. You know, a lot of times, uh, and it says addiction, not drugs. So like, a lot of times when I would try to struggle with getting clean, I would think that it was a particular drug. In the first step, we identify that, uh, the meaning of complete abstinence, where it doesn't matter if it's wet or dry, they both get you high. It doesn't matter if it's alcohol. It doesn't matter if it's just a beer. It doesn't matter if it's half a Xanax. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, one hit of a blunt. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, a crumb of a Suboxone. It doesn't matter if it's a little bit of heroin. Like, it doesn't matter if it's like a baby bump in a bathroom. Like, whatever you did, one is too many, a thousand is never enough. Like this is where we drive home the point of complete abstinence. Where if you think that your life was getting better by getting rid of like some drugs, like imagine what can happen if you get rid of all drugs. And complete abstinence is something that I challenge people to try. Because some people I know that are drug addicts, they'll be like, oh, well, you know, I've been clean this long off X, Y, and Z drug. And I really try to, you know, challenge them to be like, hey, I really would like to see what would happen in your life if you got clean from all drugs, including alcohol. And that's crazy in our society because really I don't run into too many people who don't drink alcohol. And I think now that I'm older, I see more and more adults not drink alcohol that aren't in recovery. Like I meet a lot of people that just don't like to drink. You know, I meet girls all the time that are like, oh, I just don't like drinking, you know, like. I want to kind of encourage that in society that they are subcultures of people that don't really enjoy drinking and don't really enjoy, you know, being out all night at some club or bar or whatever, or they can go out to that club or bar and not drink, you know, but for us to use is to die, you know, to use is to die. Even just one sip, one sip is really like, uh, you know, pulling the trigger on a, on a gun to my head, you know, like just one sip of beer 
And it takes a long time to train your mind to really think like that. Because when I got clean, I was like, well, it's just alcohol. You know, it's not a big deal. And I had to do the writing and the reading and understand that every time I've ever ended up in jails, institutions or whatever, that it started with the first one. You know, I was sharing the other day that like in drug addiction, we jump off the skyscraper and we pass each floor thinking to ourselves, so far, so good. And I need to train myself to think about the last hit and not the first hit. So in step one, when you work it with your sponsor, you talk about your unmanageability and how your life has become unmanageable. My unmanageability was really easy to see because people were managing my life. You know, I had drug tests, I had court, I had probation officers, I had my parents going through my stuff. Like I had consequences of me using. I truly believe that it's not until you formally work a first step with a sponsor that you are no longer powerless. I'm going to say that again. I truly believe that it's not until you formally work a first step with a sponsor that you are no longer powerless. So even if you've been clean for a year and you've never formally worked a first step with a sponsor, I believe you are still powerless. What I mean by that is that you haven't tapped into your true power. The true power isn't just in the oh, I stopped using, now I can have a job and all these other things. The first step is about surrender. And when you truly surrender, it doesn't mean like, oh, I just stopped using. Surrender means surrender to win, that I'm truly going to turn my will and my life over to somebody else, a sponsor in the beginning, right? We're going to turn our will and our life over to our sponsor. And evidence of that is by doing the assignments he gives me. If I'm going on my own assignments and I don't believe that I need someone to really guide me, I'm just going back to doing what I normally do, which is survive off my own thinking. And like my sponsor used to say, like, this is like fighting Mike Tyson. You're going to get your ass whooped every single time. He's going to knock you the fuck out. Mike Tyson doesn't lose. Mike Tyson wakes up and he thinks about knocking you out. When he goes to sleep, he's dreaming about knocking you out. This guy trained his whole life skip parties, skipped all these other things, sacrifice to learn how to box. And no matter how tough you think you are, if you haven't been trained and you don't know the technique, you're never going to be able to beat him. He can beat you with one arm tied behind his back. It's Mike Tyson. He's going to win every time. And that's why we talk about willpower, you know, because all the willpower in the world cannot knock out Mike Tyson. I don't care how bad you want to knock out Mike Tyson. It's not happening. And even the best fighters in the world have a trainer. Even Mike Tyson has a trainer. Mike Tyson's trainer can't knock out Mike Tyson, but Mike Tyson's trainer can see things that he can't see. That's what your sponsor does. Your sponsor is this outside perspective where he can see things that you're not able to see. He can push you beyond your own limits. He can push you harder. He knows how to train you. That's what a sponsor does. It wasn't until I was able to surrender and say, yo, I'm tired of getting knocked out. Show me how to fight. I want to learn how to fight. And same thing with boxing and fighting. A 120-pound kid who knows how to box can knock the fuck out of someone who's 250 pounds because he knows how to use the little power that he does have. It's not about how big you are. It's not about how smart you are. You see If it was about how smart you are, you wouldn't see college graduates get addiction. If it was about how talented you were, you wouldn't see musicians and artists uh, struggle with addiction. It's not about being smart. It's not about being tough. It's not about willpower. This is about understanding that you can't win the fight on your own and that there are some people who have won the fight just for today that can show you how it's done. So you don't want to be the big guy who thinks that just because you could throw a hard right that you're going to win the fight because guess what? Half of fighting is dodging. And this other guy might be able to dodge your punch and counter and knock you the fuck out. It's going to happen every time until you learn the techniques. The techniques come with consistency and it comes with surrender. And there are some things that I needed to learn in recovery that wasn't about how tough I was. You know? Because staying clean, like how was I going to stay clean practicing surrender? It's like a it's a, you know, a weird concept. I'm supposed to surrender and that's how I'm supposed to stay clean. But like they say, trust the process. And you know what? Like I started to learn how to fight. I started to learn where my power comes from. You know, just like in boxing, you would think that your power comes from your hands. 
But if you ask anyone who's ever fought before, the power doesn't come from your hands when you throw a punch. They come from your feet. You know, a lot of boxing comes from footwork, how you can turn your hips. You know, same thing with swinging a golf club. Same thing with like, you know, anything else like uh, physical like that. Like a lot of it is in your hips and in your feet. And I didn't know that when I got clean. When I got clean, I thought like as long as I punch my hardest, I'd be able to win. And I lost every fight I've ever been in with the disease of addiction, you know. And um, I was tired of getting my ass whooped. And for the first time in my life, I had to surrender and say, yo, I'm, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And when I said sick and tired, I mean sick and tired. You know, if you're an opiate addict, you know what being sick is. And I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. And that's what we do in step one. So your sponsor would give you an assignment. You know, read this chapter. Uh, read this other chapter. Highlight everything you can relate to. And answer these questions. You know, my sponsor made me write out the questions. I wrote out the questions. And it wasn't like four or five questions. The first step in the step working guy that I worked, there were 69 questions in there. And these weren't uh, one word answers. And some people might think like, oh, it's just answering questions. How hard could that be? Go to NA meetings and see how many people work the 12 steps. Go to meetings and ask around how many people have formerly worked all 12 steps with a sponsor. If it was so easy, everybody would do it. You know, I always share, like, I've been clean 13 years. I've only taken four people to the 12 steps. I've sponsored hundreds of people, hundreds. Everyone comes up to me, oh, Brian, you're so cool and funny and da 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 all this crap. And like, yo, will you sponsor me? Nobody wants to do the work. Nobody wants to do the work. It's hard work. It's not easy. Working the 12 steps is like climbing Mount Everest. Like, like it's going to be a long journey, but it's going to be worth it. You know, step one, we really tap into that powerlessness. And when you admit your powerlessness and you admit surrender, that's when you can start taking a different point of view on something, you know. Like when I was little, my brother would whip my ass. Like he would just put me in a headlock and I would have to surrender. You know, it's the same type of thing. But when we surrender, it's like watching someone like bump their head over and over and over. And you're just watching them. And they're just so hard-headed, they just kept doing it and doing it. But when they surrender, they can say, hey, I'm sick and tired of doing it this way. Can you show me how? And there's usually some finesse that comes with it. It's not just about how hard you can hit. There's some type of finesse that you need to learn. And in step one, that's all we do. We surrender to have someone else guide us. And a lot of times that surrender is motivated by pain. When we first get clean, that desperation will motivate the hell out of us. Oh, I'll do anything. I'll surrender. I'll get a sponsor. I'll do whatever. And as soon as that pain goes, we start to say, oh, I don't need to go to that meeting. Oh, I don't need to call my sponsor so much. I'll get to it when I get to it. Oh, I'll do it after this. So oh, I'll do it after that. But if you do make it past step one, I can say that if you've worked step one, you have finally found your power. And we tap into that into step two. Step two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. So here in step uh, two, it says we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. So what I point out in the second step is that it says, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves. It doesn't say in. So we're not even coming to believe in something. We're coming to believe in that. What that means is that I'm coming to believe in what the power can do, not in what the power is. So I'm not necessarily putting my trust in a higher power, even in step two. I'm just trying to believe that if there was a higher power out there and there was some type of power, what could the power do? So I'm not trying to figure out electricity. I'm just trusting that when you say flick the lights on, that it's going to flick the lights on. I'm trying to believe in the result of the electricity. I'm not trying to figure out electricity. Okay. That's what we do in step two. In step two, we find out what real hope is. We identify where we're getting the hope from. Step two is about hope. Step two is about open-mindedness. And when I first worked the 12 steps, my sponsor pulled over his car and he closed the book and he says, look, I'm going to tell you something, Brian, the 12 steps don't mean shit. It's all about the spiritual principles. 
the 12 steps is about applying the principles in your life. You're going to need to get familiar with the principles. And he would close the book and say, tell me the principles of step one. If you don't know the principles of step one, I don't care how good you answer the questions. It's about understanding the principles and how you can work them in your life. And I really, even with 13 years clean, tell all my sponsees the same thing. When I go over a step work with a sponsee, I close the book and I say, tell me about the principles. If you can't tell me about the principles, we're going back to the drawing board. Step two, we tap into that hope. And hope, other than brotherly love, is the only principle that somebody can give you. It's the only thing that I can give someone else. I can't give willingness to someone. I can't give trust to somebody. I can't give open-mindedness to somebody. But I'm able to give somebody hope. And the thing about hope is that the minute you get it, it's almost gone just as fast. You know, there's plenty of times where I would go to a meeting and I'd hear a speaker and he would blow me away. I'd go home super excited and the next day, psh, I'd be gone. You know, hope is something that you're constantly chasing. And sometimes, you know, we use it in different scenarios. You know, sometimes someone gives us hope in our, in our job and we have all this hope and then it goes away and we got to talk to someone else and then we get it. And hope is something that we're constantly chasing, but it's a valuable thing that we need in recovery. You know, if I didn't see somebody else get clean, I wouldn't believe that I could get clean myself. If I didn't see someone worse than me get clean, I wouldn't think that it was possible for me to get clean because I always considered myself the worst of the worst when it came to drug addiction. And step two, it says, we find additional hope by listening to other recovering addicts. We can relate to whether I've been and drawn hope from who they've become. We listen closely at meetings and become willing to apply what we hear to our own lives. As we begin to believe that there is hope for us, we also begin to trust the process of recovery. So in step two, you know, I'm trying to identify what's going on in my life and how I can apply hope in my life. You know, sometimes all I really had was that I'd be able to sleep. You know, one of my biggest issues when I got clean is I couldn't sleep. And I would raise my hand and say, like, hey, I'm really struggling with sleep. And people would tell me, like, bro, no one's ever died of lack of sleep. And people would relate to me and tell me, like, yo, I couldn't sleep when I got clean either. It'd be all right. And um, it also says, knowing that we don't have to use today is a powerful belief in itself. For some of us, this may be only a faint spark at first, but just the thought that maybe if we work this program, our lives will get better. In the beginning, many of us turn to the group or the love we encounter in 12-step meetings as our higher power. So in step two, that idea of a higher power is, is coming into play, but you know the way it was explained to me that it could be the group. You know, I really didn't believe in God when I was on step two. I really believed in like energy and I believe in like positivity. And uh, one of my assignments in step two that my sponsor gave me was one to like to read it out of the book and to answer the questions. And then one of the, my uh, assignments was to draw my higher power. And I drew my higher power. And when I drew my higher power, you know, I drew stars. I wrote a little paragraph about what I believe God is, that God is love. God is always there for me or whatever. And, um, you know, my sponsor said, I thought he was going to like really examine it and say, oh, this is right or this is wrong or this is what God is. He looked at it and he said, that will work. And that's it. That's all he ever said about it. You could have drawn, I could have drawn anything. And he would have looked at it and been like, all right, that'll work. Just about anything would have worked. And this whole time I was like overthinking, like, if my belief is wrong, what am I going to do? Like, you know, am I going to have to come to believe in Jesus or something crazy? And the reality was, is that I just needed something that I was comfortable with. And here we go, like, with another analogy that I give people is that, like, somebody who's comfortable with a nine millimeter is more deadly than someone who's not comfortable with an AK-47. So it's about what type of tool you practice with. It's not really necessarily about how good the tool is. It's about how good you are with that tool. So for me, I needed to be honest with the way that I believed. And I got friends that are atheists that are clean. I got people that are like, yo, I don't believe in God at all. I believe in energy. I believe in nothing. Like there's some people that the only thing they believe in is that the 12 steps work and that's it. And they stay clean years at a time, uh, forever and ever. You know, like you don't need to believe in some type of deity or higher power for you to really stay clean i suggest it to people because it's kind of like easier to wrap your brain around it but not for some people for some people religion got a real nasty taste in their mouth and they don't like saying the word god you know that's totally fine you can say whatever you want to say 
I know some women that's, you know, call their higher power her, you know, it's like totally okay. Like whatever you want to do is okay. So in step two, we tap into that hope. Step two, it says, along with the hope we derive from working this step, in step two, we find that our way of thinking is undergoing a radical change. The whole world looks different. Where we were before, we had no reason to find hope. We now have every reason to expect the dramatic difference in our lives. By opening our mind, we open ourselves up to new ideas. We've stepped away from the problem and toward our spiritual solution. We talk about step three. Step three says we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Now, when I got to step three, I was like, this is where it gets crazy. They're talking about turning your will and your life over. You know, I'm going to have to become a priest. I'm going to have to become someone that hands out books at, at the airport. Like, I'm never going to be able to curse again. I'm going to have to, like, stop having sex with women. I'm going to have to stop listening to fucking rap music. This is getting too crazy. Until I read it, until I asked around what step three was, you know, very simply in the book. Every question I've ever had about a step is explained in the fucking book. If I just read it, I fucking understand what it meant, you know. In step three, it says we made a decision to turn our will and our life over to the care of God as we understood him. To me, this sounds like, all right, now surrender yourself to God forever. Like, it's, this shit sounds pretty extreme. But in the book, it talks about our will is our thoughts and our lives are our actions. So if this says we made a decision to turn our thoughts and our actions over to the care of God as we understood him, still sounds kind of crazy. But the word decision is like the biggest part is that we made a decision, you know, something you'll hear in 12 step meetings all around the world. Three frogs were on a log. One of them made a decision to jump off the log. How many frogs are on the log? The reality is, is that there's three frogs still on the log. Now, the literature does say that decision implies action. And step three is when I write up a contract. I write up a lease. So when you go to rent a house or rent an apartment, you sign a lease. They verify your income. They do a background check. And when you sign on the dotted line, that doesn't mean that you paid the lease. That means that you're making a decision to pay the lease and it's up to you to follow up the contract. Now let's talk about God's will. God's will used to confuse the hell out of me because I was like, what the fuck is God's will? I used to step on an ant and I would be like, oh, fuck, God's going to punish me. And I used to like look at a girl's ass and be like, oh, no, that's unspiritual. You know, like I really was confused and I was confusing like church and religion and spirituality and I'm going to meetings and I'm still fucking fucked up and cursing and getting kicked out of school and getting into fist fights. And, you know, I'm still really fucked up in the game. Still pretty insane, right? Step three, we talk about turning our will in our life over to the care of God as we understood him. And it talks about God's will. What's God's will? I asked, one of my assignments was to go ask people with five years clean what God's will is. It's very simple shit. I asked five people. People told me this. People told me that. Uh, you know, all these different things. And I remember I was talking to someone outside of a meeting. And there was this old timer listening in and he laughed at this guy's response because it was all deep and profound. And he laughed and he was smoking a cigarette and he threw out his cigarette and he said, man, God's will is to work the rest of the fucking steps. And he walked away. And that stuck with me. That really stuck with me. God's will is to work the rest of the steps. That's it. That's as complex as it has to be. You know, people used to say, yo, you're going to be working the steps for the rest of your life. You're going to do it over and over. Just keep it simple. Keep it simple. Don't complicate it. Just get to the next one. Just do the writing. Do the reading. Just get to the next one. It doesn't have to be rocket science. Just keep going. You know, I'm going to backtrack a little bit talking about insanity. Step two is when I start to get in touch with the insanity of my life. And I start to get in touch with how insane it was for me to use the way that I was using. But not just that, it gets in touch with me identifying it so it no longer seems insane. You know, when I first got clean, I would hear about people relapsing. I'd be jealous of them. Oh, man, this guy got to use. But after a year clean, I started to hear about people relapsing. I'm like, damn, they fucked up their whole life. Their whole life right there. Just, just They used? Oh, man. And that's when I started to realize that using was no longer glamorous to me. I no longer was glamorizing using. I had been restored to a point where using was pretty fucking insane to me. 
where I used to think it was crazy to go to work for a year and never like call out sick all the time. Like I thought that was pretty crazy. Now I think it's crazy that people call out sick all the time. Like, what the fuck is wrong with you, bro? I've been restored to have different expectations of myself. I don't expect myself to be a shitty employee anymore. I don't expect myself to be a shitty person anymore. You know, I've changed the way that I think. I now, you know, think it's weird when people gossip around me. I used to be comfortable in gossip. I used to be comfortable in negativity. When I sent, f met someone so happy and positive, like, what the fuck are you so happy about, bro? Get the fuck away from me. Ain't no one want to hear that shit at fucking nine in the morning. You know, I was just a negative person. Fuck that bitch. You know, I always had to say something nasty to somebody. You know, I was a nasty, negative human being. And step two is when I start to identify that I also complain that nobody likes me. Oh, I don't have any friends. No one likes me. Well, no shit, because I'm fucking negative and I'm always fucking complaining and I'm always saying something nasty to somebody. That's why people don't like me. It's not because, you know, the world hates me. You know, you reciprocate what you put out in the universe. And I didn't learn that just by doing step two. You know, the steps are a, a guideline, but it takes time of practicing these principles in our life to really have them start to change the outside, you know? Step three talks about this is the most fundamental decision we'll make in our lives. Step three means that for the first time in our life, we make a decision. We're making a decision to turn our will in our lives over to something positive. We're making a decision to turn our thoughts and our action over to something that has worked for other people that has improved their lives. And I would say, oh, well, I'm not comfortable with that. I don't want to turn my life over. How many times I turned my will and my life over to the dope man? How many times did I risk my life over some fucking crack or some fucking drug I found on the corner? How many times did I risk my freedom over some dumbass drug? pawning shit that I know is stolen. Like how many times I take all these different chances and I having trouble trusting a process that's been proven to work for hundreds of thousands of other addicts for over a hundred years, 50 years or some shit. Like what the fuck am I really complaining about? This is also about being restored to sanity where like I start to think about how fucking insane it is that I have even the slightest intention to complain about what's going on right now. You know, the reality is that I've turned my will in my life over plenty of times. I've been doing it my whole life. I was never in control. For the first time ever, I'm about to do it in a positive way, and I got some type of reservations over that. I'm scared to do that. The fuck's wrong with me? You know? Also, this is where your sponsor comes in. That's where you call your sponsor. You say, yo, sponsor, step three is really fucking me up. I don't understand this. What is going on with step three? I don't want to turn my will in my life over because it seems like I'm going to, you know, become a, a Mormon or something or like I'm going to become something that I'm not. And what I always tell them to my sponsors is like, bro, this is getting rid of the weights that are holding you down. This isn't about getting rid of the good things about you. This isn't about changing your life for the worse. This is about changing your life for the better. This is going to be the best bag in town. This is going to be the best fucking high you've ever had. This is going to be the funnest, most exciting, most exhilarating thing you'll ever do, hands down, being alive. As an addict, there is no better journey than to work the 12 steps. It is literally life-changing. It's beyond an acid trip. It's beyond any high. The only thing that might compare to it is probably being born. It really is like being born again and not in like some corny Christian way, but like you will see things in a new way. It will change you from the inside out. And um, that's the way people talked about it to me. People were talking about the 12 steps like it was like some crazy new drug. And I was excited to work it. You know, I was like, man, all these people talking about the 12 steps. I'm excited to do this. And then I'm going to read a little bit. Out. It says, as we get ready to make the decision, we talk with our sponsor and go to meetings and we take the opportunity to share about it with other members. The search for a God of our understanding is one of the most important efforts we will undertake in our recovery. We have a complete personal choice and freedom is how we understand our higher power. We can each find a higher power that does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Because we are powerless over our addiction, we need a power greater than ourselves to help us. So one thing about step three is that when I was really confused about God's will, I was talking to this guy and he was explaining God's will to me. 
And, um, you know, this guy was super spiritual and he had worked all 12 steps within a year, which is pretty unheard of in the fellowship that I go to. And some fellowships, they work them a little faster. And this guy had worked all 12 steps in a year through the step working guide. And he, you could tell he was just on fire for recovery. This guy was screaming and yelling. He was speaking at all the meetings and he was just like, you can feel his enthusiasm. And I remember I asked this guy to speak for me and I was talking to him about the step three and I'm confused and God this and I don't know if I believe in God and, and like all these things. And he laughed and he says, what's God's will for you? And I said, well, God's will for me is to stay clean, to help people. And he laughed and he said, let me show you what the book says. And he turned to page 112 in one of our books. And there's a bunch of recovery books. You can read whatever fucking book you want. I really don't care. This is just the book that I read. I go to a 12-step program. I'm sure if you're in the 12 steps, you know what I'm talking about. So this guy read this out of uh, the 11th step. And he says, let me show you what our literature says about God's will. And he says, we see that regardless of the presence or absence of material success in our lives, we can be content. We can be happy and fulfilled with or without money, with or without a partner, with or without the approval of others. We've begun to see that God's will for us is the ability to live with dignity, to love ourselves and others, to laugh and to find great joy and beauty in our surroundings. Our most heartfelt longings and dreams for our lives are coming true. These priceless gifts are no longer beyond our reach. They are, in fact, the very essence of God's will for us. And when I read that, it was like everything I've ever thought about in my whole life, everything I've ever searched for. And I always share that working the 12 steps was looking for something that I thought I lost that I've had the whole time. It was like desperately wandering the desert for 100 years for water and then finally realizing you had a bottle in like your pocket the whole time. It was like everything I ever wanted in outside things never worked. Drugs, women, money, success, finances, getting a haircut, looking good on the outside. Like all these things worked for a little bit, but then they stopped working. I needed something else. And it wasn't until I tapped into the 12 steps that I got into the with and without part. We're like, I'm okay with or without the job. I'm okay with or without the fucking parking space. I'm okay with or without, you know, winning the lottery. I'm okay with or without all these other things, without the approval of others. I live my whole life depending on the approval of others. All I ever wanted was the approval of others. And then in here it talks about these priceless gifts are no longer beyond our reach. That means before working the 12 steps, these things are beyond our reach. Does that make sense that without tapping into the 12 steps, these priceless gifts you cannot attain, that they are beyond your reach? It's not until we tap into the 12 steps that we start to be able to live life free as addicts. Because if you use the way that I use, just being clean doesn't cut it. It's not enough. It wasn't enough for me. Talk about doing step four. Now, step four is the one step that everyone loves to talk about. It's so strange to me. And people put a lot of fear in me. Oh, I re I heard people say, like, I relapsed after my fourth step. Oh, my fourth step really fucked me up. Da -da -da. I realize anyone who's ever said that is just full of shit, fucking lying. Their lives are so fucking unmanageable already that if they made it to the fourth step, they I don't know how the fuck they even got to the fourth step. Anyone who's ever said they relapsed because of step is like fucking... I don't know. I don't even know how to say that. It's like saying you got shot by a bunny. Like there is no way you relapsed over a step. Like the steps only better your life. They only help you. They only motivate you forward. If you untapped into some shit in the fourth step that brought up some trauma, like good. Like that shit's still there. You just talked about it for the first time. You should have kept going. Like this is where you get introduced to yourself. The fourth step is the most freeing thing that an addict can do. Step four is when I got introduced to Brian, who Brian really was. This is when I first, it was like having a child that I had never met before. It was like being lost my whole life and finally finding m myself. You know, when I did a four step, it truly was like saying like, this is who I am. This is everything. You know, when I did a four step, it took me, like seven or eight months to do my four step. 
not because it was so hard. It's just a lot of writing. And I'm a writer. I write all, I'm like a fast writer. I write so much. My handwriting super sloppy. Like I love writing. And when I started doing my four step and answering the questions, I started to write a lot and I started to write a lot. And sometimes I would get asked one question in the four step and I would write like 18 pages and it took me a long time. And then recovery started to get good. You know, like I gained some weight. I was working out. I was fucking some girls. I was fucking going out. I had a little bit of friends like ah, the four step can wait. You know, I feel good already. And I finally finished the four step. And, um, you know, when I did my four step, my sponsor was when I was doing my four step and my fifth step. So in the four step, you write an inventory. So in step four, you do a a moral inventory. This can also be called a positive or negative inventory. So you try not to write it as if you're a horrible person, which is what most people do. They write all the terrible things they've done in their four step. That's what they think it's about. It's really about just writing the good and the bad. It's an inventory. You know, when you do an inventory at Publix or at a a grocery store, you don't just inventory all the shitty products that don't sell. You inventory everything. So when you do this inventory, you do the positive and you do the negative. You do the indifferent. You do, you know, like the whole enchilada. You got to do everything, right? And when I did the four step, I had trouble finding some good assets. I didn't really have a lot of assets, you know. I think writing down that I had some positive qualities was more uncomfortable than writing about how much of a piece of shit I was. And then in step five, we read that four step with, you know, hopefully our sponsors. Some people aren't comfortable with doing it with their sponsor. They do it with like a priest or something, you know. Some people have really crazy shit in their four steps. I'm not trying to judge anybody. But for me, I feel like I had to do it with my sponsor. And when I did my four step with my sponsor... He did something that I didn't expect. Before I even opened my book up, he read me his. So I was so nervous about doing my four step. I didn't anticipate that he was going to go first. And when he went first, I was like, oh, shit, this is really crazy. And like, bro, my sponsor had like some crazy shit that he did, some fucked up, some shameful things. Not very different than my four step. And when I read my four step, When I was reading it, he wasn't really paying attention. He was like on his phone. He got a call. He said, I'll be right back, but keep going. And I was like, bro, you're supposed to be listening to me, you know? And I had totally, totally missed, you know, the order of the fifth step. So when you do your fourth step, I'm just going to read what the fourth step is. The fourth step is we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. In step five, it says we admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. So there's an order in step five. We admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. The order is God, ourselves, and another human being. So that's the order that I try to live by, is that I don't try to look for everyone's approval. I try to look for God's approval, my own approval, and then maybe one other person or a couple other people. You know, I truly believe that, like, if you're not my higher power or my close friends— which is really my family. Like at this point in life, I really have seen that my close friends are an extension of my family. I really believe that. You know, some of the people I'm so close with, I really do see them like my family. And I would say most of them are addicts, you know. So if it doesn't affect, you know, if I'm looking for God's approval first and I'm okay with it and I've prayed and I've meditated, like it doesn't really matter what someone else that, isn't really in my life thinking, you know, but if someone who's close to me doesn't approve or is questioning me or whatever, maybe I need to take a look at that, you know? So in step five, I had to realize that, you know, it wasn't really about my sponsor listening as much as it was as my relationship with my higher power and God listening. And that's, it took me two times to do it. So right after I did my fifth step, my sponsor kind of stopped going to meetings. And um, when my sponsor stopped going to meetings, it really, like, messed me up, you know. This is a guy who has N.A. tattooed on his arm. This guy used to scream and yell about working the steps, get a sponsor. This guy was so gung-ho into recovery, and then he just stopped going to meetings, you know. And at that point, I had been clean, like, 18 months already. And I had a my sponsor had taught me to pray when I first got clean. Like, he really instilled, you need to fucking pray. You need to get a higher power because if I don't answer the phone, you got to figure it out on your own. He really instilled that, bro, it's not me that's guiding you. God is guiding you, and I'm pointing you to God. So when my sponsor stopped going to meetings, 
I had become self-reliant where I knew that if something were to ever happen to him, I was able to point myself in the right direction to get what I needed to get. Just like if my dope dealer stopped answering, if my drug dealer stopped answering, I didn't just say, well, I guess that's that. I'm going to get clean. Like I was like, hell no, I'm calling somebody else. So just like I had different drug dealers and I had different people to serve and I had different people to rob and I had different sources of, of income when I was using, I had to get what I needed to get when I needed to get it or I was going to be sick. Recovery was the same type of mentality that, bro, I love you to death. But if you're not able to get the job done, I'll find someone who will. And I chose to get a different sponsor. And I'll never forget that conversation with my sponsor. He said, I totally understand you're doing the right thing and I'll always love you. Like till today, like I, I, I love that man. Like that man changed my life. You know, he introduced me to everything I know about recovery. And um, I got a different sponsor and I felt like I needed to redo step four. And he was like, you sure you want to redo step four? I was like, yeah, I feel like I didn't do it properly. Like, I just felt like I didn't do it correctly, which is just silly now. And I got a new sponsor and I redid step four and five. And I wrote the same shit I wrote last time. Like, for some reason, I thought doing it twice was going to be different. But I just wrote the same shit. Like, you can't write your story differently. And I did it twice. And instead of waiting like seven, eight months to do my fourth step, I did my second fourth step probably in like two months, maybe a month. I sat my ass down at Starbucks and wrote. Like, it's not glamorous. Like, doing step work isn't cool. No girl at the meeting is going to be like, yo, I heard you did your four step. Why don't you come through to my halfway and you can smash? Like, no girl is going to think that just because you did a six and seven step that you're going to be somebody different. Like, no job is going to say, yo, we heard you did your step work. Here's a raise. Like, no one's going to come over to your house with a cake and say, yo, you did your first step. Like, there ain't nothing glamorous about doing the steps. You're not going to get a special key tag. Like, no one's even going to know. Like, really, it's just up to you. And that's kind of what makes the step so important is that there's no accolades about it. It's really about like, yo, do you want this or not? And I learned that, you know what, bro, I'm going to fucking sit my ass at Starbucks until I finish this shit. I'm going to make this a priority in my life. And when you talk about who stays clean and who doesn't, over 13 years, I've seen hundreds and hundreds of people in and out of the program. It's boiled down to this one th statement. The reason why people use is because recovery stops becoming a priority, period, end of story. The job is more important. The girl is more important. Working out is more important. Watching Netflix is more important. Sitting your ass at home is more important. Buying a house is more important. You have different types of goals. Working the steps is no longer a priority. Going to meetings stops becoming a priority. If it's a priority, you're going to continuously make effort in it. When you continuously make effort, you continuously make progress. If you continuously make progress, you're going to start getting in recovery. So, you know, it really comes down to making recovery important in your life, making an effort. And it's just like the gym. Bro, if you don't go to the gym, you're not going to see results. You can go to the gym and not lift the weights. You can go to the gym and go eat a pizza. Like, Recovery is a level of fitness and that fitness needs to be maintained and needs to be challenged constantly. Because if you do the same workout day in and day out, guess what? It stops working. You got to do something different. You got to constantly challenge yourself in your recovery. You got to go to different meetings. You got to call people you don't want to call. You got to get different service commitments. You got to work your steps harder. You got to, you know, read the book more often. You got to listen to speaker tapes, you know, like all these different things all add up over time. And when you get lazy in your recovery, you don't feel it right away. You don't really feel your life changing. But I'm here to tell you that over these 13 years, I've seen people become multimillionaires and go back to using and lose it all. I've seen people, you know, relapse with decades clean, not taking surgery seriously, you know, becoming bitter, hating everybody in the program. You know, like I've just seen like some of these people that were so positive and influential become negative and bitter and and all this bullshit. And um, really what it comes down to is having like an open heart. It's keeping your heart open, challenging yourself. You know, people are going to do you wrong if you stay clean. People in the program are going to let you down. Someone's going to owe you money. If you stay clean long enough, someone in the program will owe you money. That will happen 1,000%. And chances are someone will fuck your girl. It's okay, bro. It happens to the best of us. Like, Life goes on. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater just because you had a bad experience. I was never smoking crack and was like, you know what? They treated me real poorly at that crack house. I ain't never going there. 
You know, like I practice these principles when I was using, I practice surrender. I practice honesty. I practice open-mindedness. I practice willingness when I was on drugs, right? I was open-minded when the dope man called me and said, yo, I got some new shit for you. Like I was open-minded and willing to hop on a bus or to fucking take a bike or to hop a fence or break into a house. Like I had willingness when I was using now it's time to apply it to something positive so I could change my life for the better. Now we talk about step six. So everyone who's like scared of the fourth step, just wait till you get to step six. Step six is what separates the men from the boys, the women from the girls. Step six and seven is hands down the most life-changing steps, processes, things I've ever done. Bro, I've gone to Tony Robbins. I've done these crazy therapy workshops. I've gone to therapy. I've did like a fucking like 18 week self-development course. Like I'm really into self-development as you could be. I mean, maybe not as you could be. I'm sure there's someone who's way weirder than I am, but I'm pretty into self-discovery, self-development. Like when I first got clean, I was like really obsessed with like Eckhart Tolle and like the four agreements. And I used to watch every video Eckhart Tolle ever put out. Like, you know, I've spent hours meditating you know, I make all my sponsees do hot yoga when they get onto 11 step. Like hot yoga will definitely change your life. Some of these books will change your life. But nothing, nothing has changed my life the way six and seven have changed my life. And again, for people who have never worked steps before, working steps is simply reading out of the book this, what the step is in the book, answering the questions, and going over it with your sponsor. That's what working the steps mean. That's what doing the work means. In step six, I get introduced to my defects of character. Step six, we were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. That shit sounds crazy. That shit sounds like, God, make me perfect. Like, that's what step six sounded like to me. And what I realized is that you can remove something multiple times. And that just because I remove something doesn't mean it's gone forever. You know, if I remove the headset from the table, that doesn't mean the headset's gone. It just means that it's no longer on the table. So when I have these character defects, what I'm going to do is become aware of them. So what I did my whole life was just not really understand that I had these character defects and not really have awareness. Awareness is the spiritual principle behind step six. When I become aware of my character defects, I now have the ability to pause. You know, and like I share sometimes, it's like, you know, I have the ability to, uh, to drive a supercar. And I remember, you know, I chose to get a McLaren. And uh, I remember I was on the racetrack and I was about to track my car. And I just believe like if you have a supercar, you don't track your car, like just shut the fuck up. Like you ain't never push your car to a limit. You have no idea what your car can do. Like it's not until you take your car to the track, put a helmet on and go race some motherfuckers that you're going to realize what your car is really made to do. Your car ain't made to go on 595 all day and, you know, 40, 50, 60, even 120 miles an hour in a straight line, you know. And I remember before I was about to get in my car, this little Spanish dude, this this Spanish dude who's like, you know, pretty funny. He came up to me. He's like, bro, you're going to beat everybody. And I was like, what? And he was like, bro, it's not how fast your car is. It's the brakes. You're going to win. What makes your car so fast is the brakes. And I didn't understand what he meant. But when everyone was hitting these corners, they'd be stopping at this certain like line in, in the on the road. And I would be able to go past that line another 100 yards and then start braking because the brakes on the McLaren were so good. And um, most cars use like Brembo brakes. Uh, McLaren uses Akebono brakes. And I don't know like what makes them so much better or whatever. But, you know, even from driving Ferraris, like the McLaren brakes are just insane. Like the brakes on this car are out of this fucking world. And while everyone else, even like Porsche GT3s, like all these cars that are like, you know, track cars, when they would brake... I would try to break with them thinking that I needed to break where they broke. But then I realized that like my car can break way later than they can. And even though they were faster than me in the straightaway, because I was able to break way later in the turn, I was able to overlap everybody. And that's what step six is. Step six is we install brakes. And for if you use the way that I use, you just don't have brakes. I don't have brakes. I don't have a slow down. You know, I'm obsessed with eating, you know, like, like I can eat a thousand uh, cookies, uh, overeat all the time, you know, and like I, once I start eating bad, it's like, psh, well, I'll have one cookie and the disease will just like, oh, you'd already fucked up your diet. You might as well just have another one. 
And then I'll eat another one. And the disease would be like, oh, man, you didn't really, you ate that one so fast, you might as well just eat another one. And then I'll eat three cookies. And the disease would be like, you can't just leave on an odd number. You got to eat at least four. And then I'm like blacked out eating all the cookies, you know, like once I get started, it's really hard for me to stop. I don't really know how to stop. And in step six, we learn how to stop our behaviors by awareness, you know. So once I become aware of my lust, when I see it acting out, I can say, oh, shit, you know, I'm being lustful, like I'm fucking staring or I'm, I'm doing something I'm not supposed to be doing. Or I have a decision to say, you know what, before I make this impulsive decision, I'm going to go talk to somebody about it. You know, I have the ability to do a pros and cons list, whereas, you know, before I would kind of just like, oh, well, it feels good, whatever, I'm just going to go do it. And like now I'm like, wait, how is this going to affect me? How is this going to affect, you know, my relationship? How is this going to affect my job? Is this really going to be worth it? And I start to really think about how, you know, I procrastinate, how I'm lazy, how I overeat, how I obsess about my body and what my body looks like. And how I, you know, spend hours in the gym, how I have negative self-talk. You know, I call myself stupid all the time. I call myself an idiot. I say I'm not good enough. I say I'm never going to get this, you know. And I start becoming aware of how I interact with people. I said something nasty to somebody. You know, I fucking called someone a bitch. I fucking called someone an asshole. Like, all these little things I do throughout the day. I was, you know, screaming in traffic. You know, I fucking, I stole. I did something fucked up. I lied. And I started to write down. So part of the sixth step is writing down how you act out on these character defects on a daily basis. So every single day, I need to pick a character defect and then write on how I acted out on it. So just knowing that I have these character defects is one thing. But when you write down, hey, today I stole. Hey, today I lied. Just like, let's pick up lying. My character defect is lying. So I start writing down like, I lied about this. I lied about that. I lied, like after you do that, you're like, fuck, I'm really a fucking liar. I need to stop. You know, you start to become hyper aware because you're writing. And there's just something about putting pen to the paper. When you put pens to the paper, it unlocks part of your subconscious mind. I truly believe that if you want to change the way you act and the way you think, you need to put pen to paper and become aware of your issues. Talking about it is great. Reading about it is great, but until you really write down what you're doing and how you want to change and what steps you're going to take to change, you're not really going to tap into that subconscious autopilot behavior that have been ingrained for years and years and years. So after I did step six, I really was feeling like a piece of shit. Like when I did step six, I was like, fuck, I've been clean like 18 months a year and I'm fucking still super lustful and I'm a fucking liar and I fucking overeat all the time and then I call myself a fat piece of shit and then I obsess about fucking how fat I am and then I go to the gym and I fucking run 18 miles and then I look at myself in the mirror and it's never good enough and then I fucking got to get a haircut every fucking five days and I buy all these new shoes to make the outside look good and I'm fucking some fucking girl I don't even want to fuck anymore and I'm fucking hooking up with this person and I'm fucking lying to her about this other girl and I'm fucking in three different relationships and one of my, the girls I'm hooking up with is on blues and um I can tell you that a year clean prior to doing step six I consider myself a pretty spiritual person I was like you know I've been clean a long time I'm young I go to meetings, I have sponsees now, you know, I pray, I meditate, I read the book. And in step six, I started to see how full of shit I was. And I started to see how I still fuck up all the time and how I'm doing a lot of unspiritual things. You know, I really was at a year clean hooking up with a girl who like does my drug of choice in the bathroom. Like I really didn't see nothing wrong with that. And I started to see that even at a year clean, even though I had abs and fucking a uh, fresh haircut that I really had super, super low self-esteem. At a year clean, I'm talking about, I truly still hated myself, hated who I was. You know, I remember being obsessed with working out and um, I was at GNC and, and I remember this girl was in there and she was buying something and she went up to one of the guys who worked there and she was like pinching her fat on her side. She's like, um, how do I get rid of this? And the guy started laughing. He's like, get rid of what? She's like, this fat right here. And he laughed. He's like, girl, that's not fat. That's your kidney. And uh, we all started laughing because this girl was skinny as a rail. We're like, bro, how much fat could you lose? 
And I was laughing, but I was relating. I was like, shit, I was about to ask the same question. I'm trying to lose that same back fat, you know? And the reality was, is that, you know, working out is healthy, but if you're an addict, you can even make working out unhealthy. And if you're an addict, you can make any positive thing and overdo it and make it an unhealthy thing. And I read some stupid quote on Instagram that said, um, I don't work out because I hate my body. I work out because I love my body. And I started to realize that I don't work out because I love my body. At a year clean, I was working out because I hated my body. Hatred is what fueled my aggression in the gym. That even at a year clean, I really hated who I was. And even my first assignment to give myself seven compliments in the mirror, I had to go back and then start giving myself compliments and being kind to myself. And some of the most challenging things I'd done in recovery was gain weight. It was easy for me to be in good shape. Gaining weight and loving myself even more than when I was in shape was way harder for me. But let me tell you something, at five, six, seven, eight years clean, I gained weight and I was proud of it. I got little cute stretch marks on my stomach. I think that shit's cute. I have a belly now. You know, like, you know, I got in pretty good shape last year, but like when I had a belly, it felt good. You know, I was still confident, still as loving as I could be with a little belly. I didn't care. I care what no one, I'll take my shirt off at the beach. I thought it was funny. I thought it was like whatever. Like the only reason why I'm fat is because I don't have time to work out anymore. It's okay. It's not the end of the world. I'm going to gain some weight. I could lose it if I want later, you know, like. Then I gained way too much weight and just started eating like crazy. I just started loving myself too much, but that's like a whole another story. So anyways, like at step six, I really was feeling like a piece of shit, like a piece of garbage. Like even though I've been clean, I still struggle in all these different areas. You get to step seven, you get introduced to your assets. In step seven, we learn what to do to pause, but what do you do after that pause? And what you do is you practice the asset. Step seven is when you start applying your assets to your life and you write down your assets. Your assets are the opposites of your character defects. So your character defect could be, you know, lying. Now your assets telling the truth. So instead of not lying, we practice telling the truth. So many of us, our brains don't think in like a negative term. So it's harder for you to say, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie than it is to say, I'm going to tell the truth. So it's easier for our brains to take in something positive and affirm it than to downplay and say something that's a negative, you know? So we learn the opposites of these character defects and we become familiar with the assets. And when we become familiar with the assets, it's just like being aware of something. You know, if you think of a yellow car, you start to see a yellow car. So I start to be familiar and become aware of things like honesty, love, open-mindedness, compassion, empathy, trust, faith, all these assets that I've gained, some of them in recovery, and I learned to get comfortable with them, and I practice them more in my life. And it's just like practicing anything else. Sometimes somebody was like, yo, why would you give $5 to that homeless guy? And I'm like, bro, I'm just practicing compassion, chill. You know, if I want to fucking give that dude $5, I'll give him $5, bro. I'm practicing empathy. I'm practicing connection. I'm practicing kindness. Like these are things that I practice to get better at them. So when I don't want to do it, it's easier. So when I don't want to be kind to someone that I think fucked me over, I can, it's a little easier to be like, yo, what's up, bro? Instead of being like, yo, fuck you, motherfucker. Where's my money? Pay me. You know, like I'm able to see like, bro, they don't owe me money. I chose to give them money and I knew that there was a risk involved. And they probably got bigger problems anyways, or they would probably pay me back. They probably got way more fucking things were in, in their mind than, than my fucking money that they owe me. You know, when someone does something nasty, I try to be like understanding. Well, like, you know, maybe they weren't trying to hurt me. They were just thinking about themselves at the time, which we all do. You know, I can see, hey, look, this person did something fucked up towards me and they left. They're out of my life now. And now I can see it's a blessing. Man, like, I'm really glad. This, could you imagine this fucking loser was still in my life? Thank God X, Y, and Z happened or they'd still be in my life. And now I don't have this person in my life, you know? And like, sometimes it's not easy. It's not easy to practice spiritual principles when you don't want to. But at least in step seven, we become familiar with them and we become comfortable with them and we do practice it, you know? Step eight, we made a list of all persons we have harmed, became willing to make amends to them all. In step eight, I write down everybody I've ever harmed. Everybody. The mailman, 
my teacher in third grade, this girl that I fucking put gum in her hair, someone I spit on, multiple people I spit on, people I've slapped, fist fights I've gotten into, stores that I've robbed, and I make this entire list. And this is pretty scary because it's make amends to them all. But what I realized is that we become willing to make amends to them all. So I remember doing my eight step, like, bro, I don't want to make amends to these people. And people said, bro, you do the eight step as if there's no nine step. So in step nine, you actually make the amends. In step eight, you just write the list. So someone told me you do the eight step as if you're going to burn it when you're done. So you don't think about the amends. So that's what I did. I did my eight step and I wrote down everybody and everything and every place I've ever harmed or did wrong to. That was harder than the four step. When you write down a name and then you detail, right, how you've harmed them, it's really like, it could be a lot, you know, it's emotional, it's not easy, you start feeling bad about yourself, that's why you don't wait to do the steps, that's why you don't just work a step and fuck around for a year and work another one, like, you're really like just causing more damage, like just follow up with your step work, put some fucking pep in your step, put some fucking energy into your fucking penmanship and fucking sit down and do the fucking steps like your life depended on it, because in my opinion, it does. And I wrote my A step. And when I was reading this list, man, it felt, I felt like so much shame, you know, just reading, uh, I spit in this girl's face. I fucked this girl and fucking sold her fake drugs. I fucking robbed this fucking store. I fucking pushed my dad. I fucking stole my mom's phone. I pawned this. I sold this, you know. Um, just like all these things I've done to these people and my family and I robbed from my brother and I used to steal my sister's clothes and fucking, you know, just like all these terrible things I've done. And when I finished my A step, I put myself on the list and I was the last one on the list. And, um, I put that, like, I robbed every opportunity for myself. I fucking put myself in dangerous situations. I could have died. I put myself in situations where I felt so much shame. I neglected my health. I didn't brush my teeth. I didn't take showers. I sold things that belonged to me. You know, I fucking ruined my whole life, my childhood. I threw away my childhood. I didn't have a chance to be a young kid because I wanted to be cool. Like I did a lot of harm to Brian. And when I read that last person on the list, my sponsor looked at me and he said, that's really good that you put yourself on the list. He said, a lot of people don't think to do that. That was good. But why are you at the end? How come you're on the bottom of the list? I was like, I don't know. And I remember he said, why don't you cross your name out and put yourself on the top of that list? And I swear I started crying. I probably had a year and a half, two years clean at the time. And when I put my name at the top of the list, I just started crying. And I had realized that throughout this whole process, I had never made immense to myself i had hurt all these people i've done all this fucked up shit and i had realized i had neglected myself and with years clean like i've dove into inner child work and like that's like a whole like inner child like to me it's crazy that some people have never even like discussed inner child work or been to therapy and done like inner child work with a therapist or something but like getting to know your inner child is like doing the four step on steroids it is like truly tapping into who you really are because even the toughest of criminals have a little kid inside them. Even the worst drug addicts have a little kid inside them. And when people tell me about their sister or their cousin or their aunt and they're like, oh, Brian, they're on drugs and they're so bad and they're fucking crazy and they're not going to listen to you. Like, I still think about that little kid that's trapped in there. I still think that there is a prisoner of an innocent kid in there that is just screaming out for help, that this person just wants to feel joy, that they didn't, they weren't born addicted to drugs, being a nasty, grimy person. Like this person was once a kid who fucking played in the sand, who fucking, you know, painted their room pink, who fucking drew and fucking sang with no, you know, thought of if they sounded stupid, who told jokes, who thought it was funny to fart in public, who fucking burped and spit up their food and laughed. Like at one point, even the nastiest of people were once kids smiling on tricycles. Even the nastiest of drug addicts, no matter how old they were, were once kids that didn't deserve 
what happened to them because some of us are victims. Some of us got molested as little kids and had all sorts of fucked up shit that happened to us, which isn't an excuse to become a drug addict. But some of us just needed a little nudge and we were going to go the other way. And whatever it was that nudged us, it could have been a bully, it could have been our environment, whatever it was, but we could have went on a different path to become happy and married and loving life and growing up grateful. And like a lot of people don't, even people that aren't addicts grow up fucking miserable and fucking cheat on their significant others and fucking find themselves in relationships they don't want to be in and find themselves at jobs they don't want to work. And like some of us still get to that point without drugs. But for addicts, some of us went so far the other way that we found ourselves living below an animalistic level. And sometimes we forget that even the worst of us have some innocence in us still. And I truly believe that, like I truly, truly believe that the worst of addicts can still get clean, you know? And um, in step nine, we start to make those amends face to face, letter to letter, paycheck to paycheck, you know, like in step nine, like we start paying back those financial amends, literally not like, oh, hey, bro, I'll pay you when I can. Like step nine, you're actually doing the work to amend something. When you amend something, you add to it. Like if you amend a contract, you're adding to it. So we're not just talking about saying, I'm sorry. So a lot of times, like when I got clean, I wanted to make an amends. Making amends means in addition to. It doesn't mean that I just say I'm sorry. Many of my sponsors used to say I was sorry my whole life, so it doesn't mean anything. I'm never going to just say I'm sorry. So by the time I was on my nine step, I had two years clean. And one of my worst amends, one of the most fucked up things that I was shameful about in step four was my relationship with this girl, Brooke. And I had grown up with this girl in middle school and we were like friends. And like, I didn't have a lot of friends in middle school. Like I used to think friends were corny. I don't know why, like I just thought like, oh, friends, like fuck that. Like you ain't supposed to have no friends. Like no one's really your friend. Like I just grew up believing like, you know, not everybody's your friend and all these people that say they're friends ain't gonna be friends in like five years and you're probably gonna hate each other later and like nobody's loyal and fuck everybody. But I really did have like a friendship with this girl, Brooks Alice. And, um, <laughs> You know, I would go to her house and I'd steal my mom's car and I'd smoke weed over there. And like, it was pretty platonic for the most part. Like we were just friends. And for some reason, even till today, like I have a lot of friends that are women and not a lot of men do, but like, even as a kid, like I always valued uh, even like one person in my life that was like a girl as like a, as a friend. And when I started using drugs, she would be like kind of concerned. And she's like, hey, I heard you're doing this now and da da da. And I remember I'd go to her house in like middle school and do coke on her table all night. I'd bring an eight ball there. We would watch movies. She'd have like some girls over and it would be me and like six girls. And I remember they would think I was so cool because I stole my mom's car and was like doing coke over there. And I would do coke in front of them and just, you know, whatever, show off. And, um, you know, when I kept doing it and I got arrested, she was at concerned and, um, I remember she said, like, hey, I want to hang out with you, but if you're going to be on drugs, like, don't come over. And I remember I would tell myself, like, I'm not going to do drugs. I'm going to go over there. And I would somehow end up going there with drugs. And then she would kind of look at me, like, sideways or whatever, and, like, this kept happening. You know, she would say, look, I don't want to hang out with you if you're going to be on drugs. And it would just kind of keep happening. And then eventually she kind of, like, was, like, distancing herself from me. And then when I started doing blues and coke, I started to, like, get real nasty with her. And I really was so jealous. Like, bro, this girl was smart. She was funny. Everyone loved her. And I remember I would just get jealous of her and her life. I remember I would, like, go on MySpace and I'd look at her pictures. And, like, she was taking pictures with, like, everyone from school all smiling and stuff. And I would just be like, like, man, look at these losers. But really, I was jealous. Like, I used to be so jealous of some of these kids because, like, I didn't have friends like that. A lot of my friends were, like, seven, eight years older than me. And, um, like, we weren't really taking pictures, you know what I mean? Like, no one was really taking group photos at the time. Mainly because we were just, like, doing illegal stuff. No one really wants to see a camera. But um, I remember I got really, really angry at her. And then when I would get arrested, like, or kicked out of school... 
she would sometimes say stuff and I would just like ignore her or whatever. And she would like have like, I always thought like this fake concern. And we had like stopped talking for some reason. And um, I remember I went to military school and when I went to military school. She was like, hey, I heard you got sent away. And I remember being like, wow, like this girl really cared. She like wrote me this letter. And um, I was like, yeah, you know, I got sent away. And like, I was acting like this tough badass that got sent away to military school. And she was writing me and I was writing her. And I used to like make up stories. Like I overdosed or whatever and like have her like scared or like whatever. Like I really feed it off like her attention or making people like worry about me, which is like a real pathetic thing to do. And um, something happened when I was in military school. I got like real high one day and I wrote her like a super nasty letter. Like, fuck you. You're the reason why I do drugs or like something crazy. Just like some fucking drug addict weirdo shit at four in the morning and she stopped talking to me and when I got back to like regular school I remember you know she would ignore me and I would ignore her and like I would even make up rumors that like I had slept with her just like stupid pathetic rumors and um I remember we were at like some party or we were going to another party and I heard that she had got into a car accident And it was like a fender bender, but I pretended like I didn't know it was a fender bender. And I was like, hey, I know you hate me, but like, I heard you got into a car accident. I hope you're okay. She was like, yeah, I'm just fine. You know, it's nothing big. It was like a fender bender. And I'm with like my friend Carla and like whatever. I was like, oh, come through to Jimmy's house. We're having a party. And she's like, okay, cool. And I remember she got dropped off. And like, I remember knowing that she was coming. And I was like, fuck, I have to do these pills. I remember I snorted like three or four Roxy's. And, like, as soon as she walked in the door, I, like, screamed. I was like, get the fuck out of here. And um, my friend was like, bro, why would I kick her out of this party? And I was like, bro, just get her the fuck out of here. And uh, they kicked her out of the party. They were like, sorry, bro, Brian said you got to go. And I remember, like, I didn't talk to her for years after that. And uh, my drug addiction got worse and worse and worse. And uh, I would message her crazy fucked up shit all the time, like, fuck you, you're fat, you're disgusting, I hate you, you're a whore, which is so weird because this girl is like a virgin like all the way throughout high school. And I was just like on drugs. There's no explanation or reason for my behavior. It was just me being a scumbag. And um, she refused to talk to me. And then there was times where I'd be lonely and I would message her and she wouldn't respond. And um, right before I went to treatment, I messaged her something and she didn't respond. So I sent something crazy to her. And I will never forget her only response was, you're pathetic. And I was just like, yeah, like I am. And I got clean. And uh, when I got clean, I remember like one of the things I wanted to make amends for was like how bad I was, like how, how mean I was, just like a fucked up person towards this girl. And I used to think about it all the time. Like I would see her in school and she would just look at me and look the other way. And I just felt like such a piece of shit because this was like a good person. Like I have no reason why I acted that way. And I was just like embarrassed and I would think about it all the time because like having somebody hate you is like the worst feeling. Like someone you care about. I remember just being like, bro, why does this girl hate me? Like I would do anything for this girl not to hate me. And um, I remember when I had a year clean, I like reached out to her and was like, hey, I've been clean for a year. No response. Christmas, no response. Her birthday, no response. And um, it like really sucked. And like, I kind of gave up on it. And I remember one of my friends was like, you know, hey, I'll talk to her for you. I was like, good luck, bro. Like, she's not going to say anything. And I remember he asked her like, hey, how come you hate Brian Alzate so bad? Like, he's been clean like over a year now. And he told me her response was, that kid did fucked up shit to me for years. And I don't care if he's clean. And it'll never, like, fix, like, what he's done. And, um, you know, it it was what it was. It sucks. And I stayed clean. And um, I actually became friends with, like, these, like, group of girls. And, like, when I had a year clean, like, I was just starting to, like, do my six and seven step. And I was changing. I was, like, trying to be nice to people. And I was, like, you know, spending a lot of time by myself and going to meetings. And I was really just learning how to, like, interact with people for the first time because, like, I really was, like, this nasty, negative person. And um, I remember, like, these girls were coming over for movie night. And I was so nervous. I was like, oh, my God, like, you know, my, my friends from school are coming over. Like, what am I going to do? 
I don't really have a lot of friends from school. I only like hung out with like ex drug addicts. Like by the one time I was like 17, 18. And I remember my sister was like, you're acting all weird. Like what's happening? Like, well, my friends are coming over. I'm just like getting everything ready. They're going to watch movie night. She's like, what friends? And I was like, friends from school. And my sister looked at me. She's like, you don't have fucking friends from school. Who's coming over? And I was like, I swear, friends from school are coming over. And she was leaving and she was scared to leave because she thought like I was bringing some weirdos people. I'm like, I swear I'm bringing friends from school over. She's like, that doesn't make any sense. You don't have any friends from school. And that just goes to show that like years have gone on where I never had any friends that were like my age from school, especially come over to the house. And, um, you know, these girls came over and like we watched the movie and like two of the girls were like good friends with this other girl, Brooke. And um, when we started like hanging out and becoming friends, she was like, how could you hang out with that kid? He's like the worst. And they were like, well, he's really changed. And I remember it was like a big deal. And um, I had kind of given up that she would ever like talk to me ever again. And um, I think like around two years clean, like she had sent me something like, oh, I'm going to this college or whatever. And just the fact that she would like ask me about college or like what college she should go to or just tell me that she got in somewhere like meant a lot to me. And like maybe she didn't hate me as much. And, um, you know, years have gone on and like I, I would keep in touch with her every once in a while. Hey, whatever. Good to see you, whatever. And like whenever I would see her, it was like, I cannot believe this girl even talks to me. And um, true story, like at one point, like I was visiting her house or some shit and um, she got like scared when I was on drugs. This girl tried to get like a restraining order on me. So like I always bring up that story. Like one day she tried to put a restraining order on me. And um, when we were like in college or whatever, I remember she told me like, you know, in college I would see people do coke and like I refused to do it because I saw what it did to you. And uh, like years have gone on and like me and this girl are like now like, you know, best friends. And um, she chose to be like a psychologist, you know, and I would like to think that she chose to be like a psychologist and work with like addiction because of like her watching, like kind of what I went through. Like she basically told me that, you know, and um, you never really know when the amends is really going to take place or like how the amends is going to work. And like I share that story because like you really have to trust the process. Like, it's not going to be on your time. It's not going to happen when you want it to happen. Your parents aren't going to trust you when you feel like they should trust you. Like, they got their own process. The people you harmed, they got their own process to go through. They might never talk to you ever again. But if you stay clean and work the steps, there's always hope that you can amend those relationships. Another relationship I always talk about is my relationship with my father. I used to hate my father. You know, I used to scream and yell at him. He used to scream and yell at me. Like, today, me and my father are best friends. Like, I really do love my father. You know, like, today, like, my business partner was screaming and yelling at me. And, and like, I have employees that are like, man, how could you work with somebody like that? And I was just like, I just laugh. I'm like, I don't know. Like, maybe, like, growing up with my father just, like, give me tough skin. Like, I really do have really tough skin. Like, I can work with almost anybody, you know. And I do think that there are some ways in my upbringing that, like, have molded me to, like, really be a tough person when it comes to like business or like relationships and um like i really don't back down too much when people like talk to me a certain way and um i don't even know if it's healthy sometimes but like the way my father raised me i see a lot of benefits to it now he was really strict growing up and my father didn't exactly know all the things that a parent should do when they're on drugs he wasn't supposed to like no one expected me to turn out the way that I turn out to like I don't harbor any resentment towards him I don't feel bad about him <laughs> like I laugh about it today you know because like it was pretty crazy I couldn't imagine what I would do if my son was 14 years old smoking crack and still in the car you know and like yeah he screamed and yelled and he broke shit but at the same time it's like pff, what do you expect you know that's kind of what uh, an, a parent's gonna react like you know not everything was all kumbaya when I was growing up and it's totally fine. Like my father did it like a tremendous job raising us, you know. Now we're going to talk about step 10. Step 10 is one of the easiest, most self-explanatory steps. It's about we made a daily inventory. Step 10 is about taking an inventory and doing a daily reprieve of how you lived your life. You do an inventory of the good, the bad, the ugly, and how you could do better, you know. Um, step 11 will change your life. You know, step 11 is probably the most profound step out of all 12 steps, 
you know, in step 11, uh, had an assignment to go to a church. I had to go to a Buddhist temple. I had to go to a, a Jewish temple. I had to write down about different religions and I had to learn about, you know, the pros and cons of them and like which ones I identified with. And I started to read like other spiritual books and like, you know, this is like a two years clean, three years clean. I'm on my 11th step. And, um, you know, I really started to realize that like the whole program was about God. You know, we start our meetings with God. We end our meetings with God. You know, we pray like there is a lot of spirituality in the 12 step program, but it's not like some weirdo fucking religious shit. It's just kind of like this fluid concept and really any type of concept is welcome. Like you can believe in anything and like, you know, you, dude, I know like a, I legit know someone who's a Satanist who's in recovery. Like this dude believes in Satan and he, he goes to meetings and he works steps and he is a sponsor, you know, and he's like a really nice guy, you know, but like what I'm trying to say is that like, it's not like the God thing is so blown out of proportion. And like, I blew it out of proportion too. I really was like having trouble with it, but it's a fluid concept. It's whatever you're comfortable with. And it grows. Like when I, I had like six, seven months clean. I really felt like I was praying to nothing until like I started to turn that corner and I started to realize like, wow, I'm actually having a fucking relationship with this thing. Like I really do feel like when I pray, somebody's listening. I pray so often that it's just like my comfort zone. Like whenever I take a test at school, I would pray. Whenever I would be unsure about a girl, I would pray. Whenever I would like be unsure about like what way I was going to go in my recovery or at work, I would pray and not just pray. I would talk to my sponsor. I would do a pros and cons list. I would think about it. And I learned how to like slow down, take a deep breath, think, weigh out the consequences. How is this going to affect my life? How is this going to affect other people? And I used to think like it was silly to like ask people before you do something like, bro, you've been clean 20 years and you call your sponsor before you switch jobs. Now I'm like, bro, that's what the fuck smart people do. Smart people fucking call people with experience and say, hey, bro, this is what I'm going through. What do you fucking think I should do about this? Hey, you've been married 20 years. How the fuck did you do that? Hey, you're financially successful. What do you think I should do in this situation? Hey, can you help me in this scenario? Like, sometimes I feel like that's the difference between people in recovery and people that are not, is that like, I'm able to stop, think, pause, call, ask for advice think, do I have to make a decision now? Not really. Why am I just putting a 911 on something that's a 411? Why am I creating anxiety? Am I just enjoying the anxiety, you know? Um, step 11 had a lot to do with like a lot of people that I've seen that passed away, you know? Um, I've dealt with a lot of death being clean and like if it wasn't for the 11th step, I would probably think that there was no God. You know, I've seen a lot of good people die. I've gone to a lot of funerals. Um, one of the most impactful things that happened to me was uh, probably not too long ago. I think I had like nine or 10 years clean, maybe like 10 or 11 years clean. And like I was at the height of my career. I was working so much. I was getting like 80, 70 calls a day, a thousand fucking emails. And, you know, I was making money, doing well, had over 100 employees. And, um, you know, I felt betrayed in, in a relationship and, um, you know, like feeling betrayed is like a difficult fucking thing to go through. Like when you feel like someone really robbed you, someone really, really hurt you. And I was feeling like some type of way in my business was like all over the place. And I was scared of what the future was going to hold. And um, I really had a suicidal thought and I hadn't had a suicidal thought since I got clean. I almost forgot what it felt like. And it made me kind of think like, whoa, I haven't had that thought in a long time. And it's funny because I used to have that thought all the time. And it's like me and that thought like became friends. And we're like, hey, what's up, bro? Not much, just suicidal today. Oh, cool. Like I got so used to being suicidal that I had forgotten what it was like to not be suicidal. And then it happened the other way around where I had not been suicidal so long. I had forgotten what it was like to feel suicidal. And I'm not talking about just saying, oh, fuck my life or, oh, I fucking hope I would die. Or I'm just, you know, sometimes I say crazy shit like, oh, fuck, if this doesn't happen, I'll slit my throat on Facebook Live. I'll say something crazy like that just because I have a morbid, fucked up sense of humor. And I remember I was driving and my phone was like, ding, 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 ding. 
And I was just trying to listen to this song and relax. And like I was taking this drive to West Palm and my phone was just like ding, ding, ding. And I answered one of the calls and I put it down. And I was trying to listen to a song, just ding, ding. It was just, and then it rang and then I answered the call. And then I looked at my emails and then I looked at the WhatsApp chat and like it was just ringing and ringing and ringing and ringing. And then it was just dinging. And that was my whole fucking life is this fucking phone just blowing up constantly. And I remember I just had this thought like, gosh, it's just fucking blow my brains out and it wasn't like i should just blow my brains out it was like there was a reach to it it was like grab a gun put it to your head pull the trigger like i it felt different than just a thought going through my head and that's when i had to like take a step back and sometimes people are like bro you don't answer my call it's okay dude <laughs> feels good i'm practicing not answering calls i work on that today Sometimes I'm like, do I really need to answer this person's call? It's fucking 11 o'clock. Nah, I'm not going to answer it. I'll answer it tomorrow. Sometimes my attorney is like, bro, you got to, we got to talk about this, da, 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 I'll call you tomorrow. And he just calls me. I'm like, bro, don't call me. Like schedule a call with me. And I had so many employees and felt pulled in so many different directions. I needed to tell people like, hey, look, you can't just call me whenever you want to call me. I'm going to fucking lose it on you. Just schedule it with me put it in my schedule and like i live off my calendar like i put things in my calendar if i don't go to something i don't freak out hey if i'm late i don't really like trip out too much if i'm like a little late if something's really important i'll be there 15 20 minutes early if i miss a call it's not the end of the world and i had so much pressure on myself being like a young entrepreneur that like i really really was striving for perfection and my business partners and they need to make their money and this person's not happy and we're in audit with this insurance company and like all this shit was going on and i realized that like it's gonna be okay it's gonna be totally okay like what's the worst case scenario this shit falls apart it's gonna be totally fine i'll figure something out and that didn't just happen on my own like i went to therapy you know i remember like thinking like i need to go to therapy i haven't been to therapy since i've been clean and I think like at 10, 11 years clean, I went back to therapy and I went to this one and I had tried going to therapy before, but I wouldn't like someone and I just wouldn't go. Here I was like, I need to go to therapy or something fucking crazy is going to happen. Not that I was like needed to be Baker acted, but like I knew that I needed extra help and I went to therapy. And I remember I went to this one therapist, didn't like her. Went to another therapist, hated her. Went to another therapist, hated him. He sucks. This person, I like hated everybody. And then I asked around and someone gave me this recommendation. I went to this guy's house. He had like this like weird little tiny apartment in like Miami. And it was like, you know, <laughs> it looked like like some weird like Hawaiian rental with like some bamboo furniture and just like super tacky. And it was like this overweight guy with a beard that was like pretty flamboyantly gay. And I talked to this guy for like three hours. And it was like, it felt so good to just like, vent about everything and like this guy had a phd degree like he had all these other like all these letters behind his name and like with therapy you get what you pay for and i remember like going into therapy and being so excited and it felt so good to talk to somebody and he was like i could do emdr therapy i was like sign me up he's like have you ever been hypnotized and i was like no fuck that like let's do it right now he's like no we'll do it next week i'm like hypnotize me emdr me whatever you got to do I probably had like 12 sessions with this guy, maybe 15 sessions with this guy. And he had me hugging a pillow. He had me hitting a teddy bear, you know, like all these different types of like therapeutic things. And like, it felt really good. And then after that, I did like this uh, spiritual self-development training program. And it was like 18 weeks. It seemed like a fucking year. It was like this crazy ass course. And um, it helped me out a lot. It helped me a lot with balance. Helped me a lot with putting my phone away. It helped me a lot with not worrying so much. Help me not thinking that everything's the end of the world. And um, even though those outside things are so important, there was times where I went to a meeting and would think like, wow, just being at this meeting is what I was missing. Like how many meetings am I going to? Sometimes just going to a 10 o'clock meeting, not saying a word and just sitting there just felt like I need to focus back on my recovery. And I share that because I've seen a lot of people with multiple years clean, 10 years clean, decades clean, amass all their dreams just to throw it away and like we share in like the rooms all the time like don't let the gifts of recovery take you out of recovery and then we go on to step 12 
Step 12 is when you realize that it's not about you. Step 12 is having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. We try to carry this message to addicts and to practice these principles in all of our affairs. So in step 12, it's guaranteed you will have a spiritual awakening. After having had a spiritual awakening, your spirit will awaken if you work the 12 steps. I've been to thousands of meetings, thousands of meetings. I've never heard anyone say, Psh, I worked the 12 steps. That was a fucking waste of time. Never heard anybody say, yeah, I worked the steps. They didn't do anything. Never heard anybody say that. The only negative shit I've ever heard from someone talking about the steps is someone who only did one, two, and three, someone who used halfway through. Like I share all the time, like just because you had salami, a pepperoni, and some fucking tomato sauce and a piece of bread does not mean you've tried pizza, right? Like pizza is not the same as all the ingredients separated. Just because you understand the concepts, just because you know what they mean, does not mean that you've had it all together all at once. Clean time does matter. When you do your nine step, you're not doing your nine step with just saying you're sorry. You're doing your nine step with all the other steps behind you. When I made my amends to my father, I didn't just come out of detox and say, I'm sorry, dad. When I made my amends to my father, I had over two years clean. That was two years of him being able to sleep at night. Two years of being my word. Two years of me being responsible. Two years of him not having to worry about me. Two years of me not having to fake a fucking drug test. Two years of him not screaming and yelling at me. You know, like I went there with like substantial time of uninterruption of their peace and and whatever he had going on. So when I did make my amends, it wasn't empty. I went there with something to bring to the table. And sometimes it's not a financial thing. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it's just the clean time. Clean time matters. Clean time means something. If you've been clean a year and you relapse, and if you've been clean two years and you relapse, it's totally different than being clean three years. It's not the same. I'm sorry to break it to you. I'm not saying it's a waste of time. I'm not saying it's not a good. I'm not saying that if you relapse, don't come back. I'm saying that there is something really amazing when consistently is added to the mixture. There's something really amazing when you do all the steps of the cake in order. All right. If you make a cake and you fuck up the mix and you fuck up the order and you fuck up how much you have to put here and how much you have to put there, the cake's going to come out fucked up and different. When you do it the way that it's supposed to be done, it's totally different. All right. Step 12. We try to carry this message to addicts and to practice these principles in all of our affairs. Step 12 is when I realized that this had nothing to do with me. That I truly believe that the only reason why God allowed me to stay clean was because he knew that if Brian stayed clean, he'd be able to help another kid just like Brian. I believe that God knew that if he was able to help just one person, that person would help another person. And maybe it's not in a 12-step aspect. Maybe it's just in like a fucking kind way. Maybe it's just in like a, a generous way. Maybe it's like some little thing you do throughout the day, a random act of kindness. Like a random act of kindness can change the whole world. And this isn't like some hippie weirdo bullshit. Like the world is fucked up. Punishment does exist. If you do something fucked up, you will go to jail. Somebody might kill an innocent person. Like fucked up shit goes on in the world. And I used to think as a kid that God didn't exist because why are people starving in Africa? And I used to think, why does God exist if fucking young kids get cancer and like all this shit? But the reality is, is that God is here and it's not necessarily to change the course of life. It's to be there for us. Like, I truly believe, like, God's job isn't to get rid of the cancer. God's job is to be there while you have cancer. God's job isn't to fucking right the wrong that someone did to you. God's job is to help you see why they did that and not to live with resentment. You know, God's job is to live in your spiritual world. He doesn't live in the physical world. So why would you expect something that doesn't do that to do that? Why would you go to the hardware store looking for milk? They don't fucking sell milk at the hardware store. It's a fucking hardware store. Stop asking God to fucking find you a parking spot. He doesn't fucking find parking spots. If you found a parking spot, it's not because God fucking gave you a parking spot. It's just my opinion. Some people do believe that God gives you parking spots. I personally don't believe that. I believe that when I pray to God, it's like, God, if I don't find a fucking parking spot, let me not overreact and throw this out of proportion. Act like this is the end of the world. God, if I do find a parking spot, let me be grateful for that motherfucker. 
God, let me not kill somebody today because they stole my parking spot. I'm not asking God for the physical outcome. I'm asking God or a higher power or some type of positive energy to hold my hand during the process because I can act like a little child sometimes. Sometimes I need someone to hold my hand and say, it's going to be okay, pup up. It's going to be okay, you know, Brian, it's not that end of the world. Because even when I, I don't know why I said pop up, no one's ever said it to me, I don't even know if that's a word. But like, even when I overreact in business, in God's eye, it's no different than a little kid being mad because someone didn't want to play with him. That's what it's really about. If someone betrays me in business or someone doesn't do what I want them to do, and it might seem like the end of the world, in reality... It's no different than being a little kid and being in the sandbox and someone fucking threw sand on me. Someone fucking didn't want to play with me. If fucking my girl cheats on me, it might seem like a big deal because I'm an adult and people aren't supposed to do that. And I trusted this person. But at the end of the day, it's no different than like some kid in a park and their girlfriend kissed another boy. Like, you know. Just because we're adults, we tend to think that it's a big deal. And then when it happens with kids, we're like, oh, it's it's just a kiss. It's not a big deal. It's cute. You know, if you had like a five-year-old son and his five-year-old girlfriend fucking kissed another boy at the fucking jungle gym, you wouldn't be like, oh, man, like, fuck that bitch. You'd laugh about it. But when we're adults, we don't laugh about it. People murder people over fucking kissing somebody else, you know? And sometimes I need to tap into that childish part of me and tell them, hey, It's okay, bro. It's going to be okay. People talk shit about you. It's okay. Like my mom used to say, people even talked about Jesus. It's going to be fine, Brian. You're going to be okay. It's not the end of the world. And a lot of times, the worst things that happen to my life are blown out of proportion by my own thoughts. You know, I've become aware enough that I'm not my thoughts. I'm not my body. I'm not the car that I drive. I'm not the clothes that I wear. Those things have to do with my identity and who I am. But what I am, I'm a human being. Below that, I'm just a spirit, just some fucking thing that's going to be on earth for fucking maybe, if I'm lucky, 90 years, 100 years, maybe 40 more years, 50 more years from now. Like life ends so fast. It's really silly that we get caught up in so much dumb shit. And I'm talking about myself. We get caught up in the job and work and the fucking insurance payment and fucking, you know, your car payment and your fucking mortgage and fucking driving these fucking metal cars to fucking work so we could sit in a cubicle all day. And really, like, the only thing to do in life is to just be grateful. No matter where you are, that's all you can really do is be grateful. You could be at peace. You can try not to harm others. And if someone harms you, you can try to see why they would do that to you and maybe just have some empathy and just be grateful that maybe you're not doing that to someone at the same time. And that's my little spiel with the 12 steps. Thanks for listening to Hell Has an Exit. I am your host, Brian Alzate. Shout out to the DB podcast, the Dust Brothers. That's Jordan and Miles. Uh, I appreciate you guys. Thanks for doing this uh, last minute. Miles, I know you're on a plane. This is going to be a long one unless we're cutting it in half. I appreciate you guys. Thank you. This show is not affiliated with any specific 12-step program. If you or a loved one is struggling with an addiction, please find a local 12-step meeting. If you believe you may need detox or drug treatment of any kind, please call 888 699 9395 to speak to a specialist. The show is sponsored by United Recovery Project, a state of the art drug and alcohol rehab facility. You can visit our website at unitedrecoveryproject.com.